Oh. Oh, call me the tax man. You have to be hard to live here. I was alleged I robbed him, took £50,000 worth of heroin off him, but over a thousand fights and won every man I've ever fought, so you fight to the death and that's it. Just awesome genetics, isn't it? Basically, I'm the law in this area. Picked him up and I ran at him and threw him into this door and the door fucking smashed his head into there. And he fell back and I headbutted him and I threw him at the end of the door really hard. Brian Cockrell is one of Britain's most notorious gangsters, a self-proclaimed justice system of the underworld. In his world, only the strong survive, and every could be his last. For 20 years, Brian Cockrell has used his brutal reputation to extort millions from drug dealers. He sees it as a tax, a levy they have to pay to allow them to operate in his area. For people who don't know what taxing is, it's a... Uh Drug dealers sell drugs in the streets, and when they sell the drugs and they get the profits, the money, I'm usually going to take the money off them. Obviously, they can't go to the police and say, well, my cop was just been around and took vast amounts of money off and vast amounts of drugs, because obviously it's illegal to sell drugs, and so as they try to convict me, they convict themselves. Despite the risks, and at 42, Cockrell remains on top of his game. His lifestyle requires him to be brutal and intimidating. He commands fear as he marshals the underworld in his patch. Most people who have tried to emulate me are either dead or they're doing life sentences. And to do it, it probably is the hardest job in the world. These days, taxing drug dealers is not what it used to be. The dealers don't have as much cash because competition has hit their profits. The taxman's returns are not quite as lucrative. I remember one day we went out and we made 15 grand in about five hours. This was 20 years ago. You know, a massive amount of money. Years ago, when you used to tax them, there'd only be half a dozen in each town, so you could hit them, and they'd have the drugs in the house. They'd have the money in the house, and uh, you'd kick the door and run in, you'd get drugs, money, and you'd make a fortune. Cockrell calls himself the tax man. The reality is that he uses his great strength to muscle in on criminals and their ill-gotten gains. But wrestling huge sums of cash from top drug dealers is not without risk. To keep one step ahead of his enemies, Cockrell trains three times a day. He is a 22-stone steroid-filled fighting machine who claims never to have lost a fight. Like, say I was fighting you in the street, I'd catch you with a right uppercut there, I'd have come in, come on, yeah. fucking throw your shot. So I'm yeah. coming in there, you know. So if I couldn't catch you with that, I'd come in and grab you, yeah. I'd throw it, pull my arms yeah. and pull, see your eye, yeah, pull your eye there. Yeah. So as you're going out, pull your eye out. And as and I'm I'd pull your ear, I'd put your knee and pull, bite your ear off. So your ear's coming up and you're screaming. I mean, it's like if I grabbed you in a headlock, just yeah. like that. There's no way you're getting out of that, no. there, you know. No. And if I crushed you, like, the, sorry. I'd pull his eye out within about three seconds, he was fucked. But when you pull the eye out, it dangles like on a socket, it's like on a, like a string. I fought this lad and I bit his ear and his nose off. But I was feeling very generous that day and I'd given them back. I was a bit like fucking Hannibal Lecter, I suppose. What did he look like afterwards, was it? It looked like Hannibal Lecter had got older. him. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's been alleged in the past that I've been, well, I've been charged with these things. It's not just alleged, I've been charged with uh, murder charges, um, attempted murder on two police. 30 or 40 section 18 wounding with intent, I'd punch in someone with hand, but a wounding with intent, a section 18 usually you've got to use a, a weapon, but the class of my hands is uh, deadly weapons anyway, the police. I've been uh, arrested for um, racketeering, blackmail, kidnapping, firearms, drug dealing, um, taxing, um, shootings, I'm supposed to have people shot, um, people murdered, I'm supposed to have people taken away and killed. I suppose I've um, killed people myself. I've been alleged that I've had people's uh, pubs, petrol bombs, burnt out, cars burnt out. Did you do all those things? Would I do all them things? Come on. Um, maybe some of them, but not all of them. Despite being questioned thousands of times and hundreds of arrests, Cockrell's only convictions are for dangerous driving, criminal damage and threatening behaviour. What does he look like? to you when he's fighting? He changes totally. 
absolutely totally just goes blank. There's no expression or anything on his face. His eyes go black. And then you just turn it off like that and he's back to normal. Amanda, Brian's partner, has seen it all. Her loyalty to Brian has been unflinching, despite constant fears of revenge and reprisals to the family. It isn't as easy as you think. It sounds easy, but it isn't. You try and think about going up to someone and saying, I want your money and I want your car and I want whatever. It isn't as easy as you think. If it was easy, they'll be done, wouldn't they? Brian lives by the law of the jungle. He has a passion for huge animals and has intimate knowledge of the behaviour of predators. I went to a zoo once, battering furnace. But, um, I was stood there and the tiger pissed all over me, the female one. The bloke said it must be the hormone doing your test. Also, it must smell it. It's just a sign of whatever you, you'll find out when you go and do the tigers. But I stood there, so a big ginger pussy pissed all over me. <laughs> It's alleged that I've taken people away and played the piggy game on them. And people say, what's the piggy game? Like, well, I've took their shoes and socks off and broken each toe with a hammer until they've told me where the, the money is or if they, they move out of town and stop torturing people. But none of these little pigs got bread and butter. And they all went wee, wee, wee all the way on, but uh, they all were screaming. But you never get past two. Now the taxman is planning to take his unconventional style into politics. He's decided to fight for election as mayor. He believes that he can use his powers of persuasion and that voters will see sense and back him. So why do you want to become mayor of Middlesbrough? Well, it was an idea an old woman said to me one day. She said, we'll be the mayor. He's trying to help us, but he can't help us. She said, but you've done more than the mayor. So I thought, you've got a good idea. And she said, why don't you run for mayor? And the other people next door but one said to me, we, um... We can't fucking sell our house because the dealers are there. So I've kicked the door in, ran in, grabbed them, threatened them, got rid of them and uh, chased them up the town. These police have been coming to this house for two years, constantly two or three times a day. Couldn't get rid of them. I got rid of them in ten minutes. I'm doing it as a one-man band. What would it be like? I've had a full the community behind me, you see. And you're certain, and you're certain that actually uh, you, you get votes? Yeah, 100%, yeah. I think there's a lot of people would vote for me because they know I do the job properly. Getting the job done is Cockrell's trademark. With a backup crew in place, few risk incurring the taxman's wrath. If I go look for him, Liam, I will fucking hate him, you know what I mean? Drug dealers face many dangers. Top of the list is the taxman, Brian Cockrell. A one-man fighting machine. Over the years, the taxman claims he's made millions from local dealers. And if backup is needed, the taxman's loyal crew can be very persuasive. Meet Rob, Lee, and Vulture. Well respected man. Yeah, but he can be a monster if he wants to be. He's not a nice person if he's on the wrong side of him. But he is a gentleman. It's because he's got a lot of respect off a, a, lot, a lot of hard people in the area, in the northeast, down London. Fought them all. He's well known, he's fought them all. He's fought all With the fists. Athletes. With fists. With fists, yeah. He's, he's, he's a dangerous man. If he's feared. A call brings the taxman to the edge of town, where a car has been stolen from a local dealership. The young lads stolen the car. Obviously, I think it's young lads. We broke in, stole the car. They've drove so far in the car. The cars were out of petrol. So the police have obviously received, got the call, said his place has been broken. He's come down the fingerprint, all the bullshit. The gate have been smashed in. The police have took the car to the compound and now they want £300 of him to get his own car back from the compound, which I think is fucking scandalous. The police get, get, a, get a garage to come and pick it up. They pick it up, and obviously they want pay for doing it, so they're coming back to me. These fucking assholes, I'll find out where they are by tonight and it'll be sold. I'll make them pay the £300 to get the car back. We're off now, let's go. I'm like a fucking crusader, mate. <laughs> Keep Crusader, just need a fucking deep. I need a red phone. The file shouldn't solve anything. Why does my fucking phone never stop ringing? <laughs> Hello?
by the car thief. Kid was in the fucking pinch the car. If I know he's related to you, or whatever, what you're saying, but if he fucking goes in, pays Eddie 300 quid, which is the recovery money, nothing's gonna happen. If he doesn't, I'll break his fucking hands and his feet. Make sure when he goes in, don't let me down, because if I go looking for him, I will fucking hurt him, you know what I mean? He's got such a good heart, you know. He really has. Once you're, once you're his friend, you know, you're his friend for life. And he will look after, no matter where you were in the world, if you needed him, he'd be there for you. And if you're his enemy? You'd be there for you now. <laughs> it's been a different way. The taxman, with his loyal crew, tracked down the apparent car thief to ask him to atone for his crime. Hours earlier, the thief was beaten up. As to who's responsible, no one is saying. You can't go around doing them fucking things, you know what I mean? You're going to have to hold the ground, son. I give him work, I'm saying, giving him work, yeah. I give him work, and all he does is just fucks it up every time he fucks it up, but he's just not listening. Nobody's going to hit you, stop being panicking, I'm not going to hit you. I'm going to hit you, so I'm going to hit you in front of fucking people, so I'm just trying to educate you. Just fucking get your head straight. Sorry, I'll do that. Yeah. I'll just pay him every week or something, all right? Give me a word. All right. All right. Alright, good lad. Cheers, mate. Alright, son. I'll be in the minutes, alright? I'll be in the minutes. Thanks, Sam, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, but he's a good kid. 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 The taxman's unconventional approach to petty crime is controversial. He claims to do a better job than the police. Obviously, as high ranking police officers, don't like the thought of Joe Public phoning me. I'm on about your average person phoning me to sort things out for them because. They've got no lack and they've got no faith in the police. Cockerel for mayor. Vote for Brian. Look, the taxman, Cockerel. Now the taxman wants to send a message to the wider community. He's putting his muscle behind a campaign for mayor and believes no one is going to stop him. Wait. I'm running for mayor next year in Middlesbrough. I wonder if you'd vote for us. My name's Brian Cockerel. And uh, this is the important thing we're doing. Just to t stop the, the drugs on the streets and everything we're going for. Call me any car, with any carry on, any idiot, and you just phone me now, something else. Okay, okay mate, you. no problem with that. Bye, no, take care. Yeah. Look after yourself. Would you vote? Definitely. Yeah. And for your family as well. Yeah. So I'll leave that with you. That's just what the campaign thing's about. And uh, there's nobody better than me to clean the streets up, is there? Well, I'll vote for you, mate. You want to post so you keep shot? Off fucking shit off the fucking streets, I'll do anything for well, you. You know that. Fucking hell, who's better to do it than me? Okay, thanks for the time, love. See you now. Would you vote? Yeah. I can count on you. Thanks very much. Cheers, love. Thank you. See you at the voting thing. I'm running for mayor next year. I wonder if you vote. He wants to tidy the streets up. Well, that is ideal, yeah. Oh, there's me little pal, Terry. Cockrell can certainly count on Terry's vote. Terry also has a reputation for being a tough fighter. We've been friends a long time, right? Yeah. And um, in honesty, he doesn't bully people. He, he sees injustice right, as I've done myself. He doesn't see people abusing people. He's got a heart to go, but the same kid, right, you can't play games with because he's a monster when he needs to be. But he doesn't only monster the people need to be monsters. He's a monster of peace, but he, he's a pal and he's a, he's a gentleman. Yeah. People Friendship thought... and loyalty mean the yeah. world to me. Yeah. You, can't, you can't put a price on it. And, yeah. um, and honestly, in trouble, it's like um, sometimes you get dicked through a man full of shit before you find good folk. Yeah. He's good folk. I wouldn't promote violence with anyone, but sometimes, no. you know, we don't live in an ideal world. We live, uh, you know, in an underworld situation. Yeah. situation but like, yeah. friendship and loyalty is a major thing yeah. in Teesside. Grant, I'm going to go in because. Okay, man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I've got a couple of nice. Hi, right, lads. Okay, no problem. <laughs> hey, cat love, look. <laughs> If elected, Brian promises a novel approach to fighting crime. Car crime is a major problem throughout Teesside, but Brian has his own ideas on how to deal with it. It looks to me there's been a chase and the car's been smashed in there, obviously. Ambulances and everything. Please give chase to a stupid car thief. The person panics, drives like a maid to get away from the police, hits someone and kills them. For what? A stolen car? I don't just let them get away with a fucking car and 
get the car later on, it's been abandoned. To me, it's a ludicrous thing. There was a woman killed not long ago. The daughter lost her leg and the woman was killed through a daft car chase. The car's worth, what, a couple hundred pounds or something. The taxman believes that solving car crime is a no-brainer and has set his sights much higher by promising to tackle the city's vice problem as well. You can see the girls walking about now. There's one there, there's two over there, and there's one there. And look at the size of her, she's only a little kid, isn't she? No, she looks about 15 years old or something. It's absolute shame. It makes me, it gives you a lump in your throat type of thing when you see them right here. They've got to be 12, 13, 14 year old. I mean, they're full of makeup and still look like little kids. And this is why I would run for me, you see. That album will help them kids. I don't know exactly what 100% what to do, but at least I would try my best to do something, look into it, you know. And uh, these black lads are coming from Jamaica. I mean, the streets are crawling with them. There's only me doing something about chasing them back. I mean, all right, it might be vigilante, but at least I'm trying. And people are asking me, saying, please, can you do this? You know, and, and I'll do what I can. I'll do my damnedest for them. And I won't say no, and I won't say yes. I'll say, I'll do my best for you. I'll see what I can do. So you're Robin Hood? I'm like, yeah, Robin Hood. But even he wore a mask. The tax man who doesn't drink or smoke says he believes in old fashioned family values, where a woman's place is in the home and children should be equipped for whatever life may throw at them. His only son Jordan has just turned 15. Under his father's watchful eye, Jordan is building up muscle and stamina for whatever lies ahead. This is my dog Charlie, pedigree boxer. Doesn't like no one. Likes, likes more than me, obviously. He's a bit wild as well. He's still a good dog, he's clever. See, sit down with me. For Brian, size is important. He admires the big things in life, be they man or beast. He believes his great stature makes him untouchable. Hey, wrap it in now. Wrap it in now. Wrap it fucking in now. I'm telling the both of you. A fight has broken out in a local pub. Jordan is there and the tax man is worried. There's been about 200 people in there. My son was in there, so loads of kids have been in. And uh, the Stockton kids from in Stockton Town Centre have started fighting with the lads from Ingleby Barry. I've heard about it, so I flew around. There's about 40 police officers here earlier on. They tried to stop me coming in, so I just threw them out the way. I said, get out the fucking way. My fucking son's in there. And he said, oh, I said, get out the fucking way. And then I walked in and uh, my son read the brains to get out before the trouble kicks off. He's gone there, but I've come in, his kids all coming up with busted noses, been up with glasses, his lad's been stabbed. And it's just been uh, a mad case, but they're all like 18 year old, 16, 17, 18, 19, 19 year old kids being daft. Had a few drinks and thinking like they can fight 10 men, none of them could fight sleep. How many people got stabbed? A couple of them, just, just one. Just Richie? Yeah. Like they were brawling around here and I went over to split them up and then the last one for me. So as he swung for me, I was like, oh. So I started swinging. Yeah. 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 And bloody, everyone fights, I suppose, but uh, not like this, not with bottles and knives and things. And they're all pissed. Jordan's best friend, 16-year-old Ryan, used to be a binge drinker. But after getting involved in a number of fights, Ryan was served with an ASBO. Breathe in. Oh. Brevo. Before I start turning my brain, like, over the Christmas period and before, I used to drink, like, quite a lot, like, a couple of bottles of whiskey a day, where I was, like, really involved in fighting, I used to fight, I used to think I could fight.
allowed to have fire. Can you feel that, yeah? Jordan's dad has taken Ryan under his wing and is helping him develop his physique. Ryan phoned me one day and said, right, it's time to train. And it's, from then on, I've been training, doing track to keep out of trouble. I think you bum up like you're a duck, like that position. That's better. You're still bending forward quite a bit, just saw you like that. I think you've got two left feet. So, six. Good luck. Jordan Seven. Hero worships his dad and considers him to be, in his own way, a celebrity. Like he's got legs like Bambi now. Yeah. I don't like boasting about it. I never have. Fair enough, you might be one of the hardest. Like, you might be one of the hardest, like, about, fair enough. But there's no need to, like, like, stand behind him all the time. I can stand up for myself as well. Everyone says, like, oh, why did I dad like that? I boast about him. And I was like, what's the point? You're not like that. He's your dad. You don't boast about your dad. Family in there. If you come here, just take a second to speak, and you come to her, her or Jordan, I could make a phone call, and within an hour you'd be shot dead. There's no, no quims about that. I want to know models about doing it. If you tried to hurt my family, I wouldn't think twice about it. In some quarters in this town, a certain layer of society, yeah. you're the law. Yeah. And do the, do the police recognise that? You believe that, but do the, the, police, do the police... I think they know that as well, and I think a lot of high-ranking police officers don't like the thought of me having more power than them, and that's, that's the whole top and bottom of it. It's a game between you and the police, isn't it? It's a cat and mouse game, isn't it? But I can't afford to, um, be, be, I can't afford to be caught, can I? So, but I think I'm the cat now, and they're the mice. It's a game where the taxman, for anything from a few hundred to several thousand pounds, sets himself up as judge and jury. His is an alternative justice system that's used by those in the area who've lost confidence in the police. We had a break in and I told Brian about it and we've got CCTV up. By the time we phoned the police, the last time I showed the police it, they said that because the footage wasn't that accurate, yeah. you couldn't pinpoint the person. And how long did showed it take? Brian there. How long did it take you it to get them? them? It took them what, less than half an hour. Um, we, we looked at the footage. Brian said, I, I've seen him. We were on the corner and we, we got the lad and he compensated us for the window that he broke, which, which is brilliant. And the thing is, the kid didn't go to jail. After he got told, yeah. mum come to me, the, the kid, mum come to me and said, oh, thanks for helping us, blah, blah, because yeah. he, cause I screamed. I said, oh, fuck, I'm smashing it. I screamed. I wasn't going to hurt him. I just was only a kid, about 18. Yeah. And his mum said, that's the best way to do it, because you frightened him now and he hasn't been burgling and robbing like he was. So she said, you've kept him out of trouble. See, with all the lads around here, you just mentioned Brian's name and they know that Brian means business. Cockrell's future as a fighter, security consultant, extortionist, and self-proclaimed one-man justice system can't last forever. So now he's looking to less dangerous activities. A lot of people have been paid off, as you see, we've got a big industrial area. British Steel, ICI, Will, and things like that. And to get paid off, they might get £50,000 after one, 30 or 40 or whatever. So they get paid off, so what they'll do is invest the money into cigarettes. They'll go abroad to somewhere like Belgium or Spain, buy the cigarettes for whatever price, one more 50 a packet. Come back here, they sell them for 2 50 and make a pound on a packet. And they might get 20,000 packets, which is 20 grand, you know. The money in the cigarettes is phenomenal money. But why are the cigarettes is more lucrative than the drugs is, is the jail sentences. You get caught selling cigarettes, you might get three months, you get caught selling a couple of grams of heroin or a couple of grams of coke, you go to jail for a couple of years. So that's the big difference, and this, the amount of money what you make in drugs is nowhere near as amount of what you make in cigarettes. Some of these fag men are making 40, 50, 60 grand a week. Kev, what was you keeping out of trouble? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, down here. Good lad, good lad. Doing well, pal. In nearby Hartlepool, Brian meets with a group of mates. Okay, all right. Keeping out of trouble. Can you just turn that off or just wait here while we go outside to see the mates again? Because you can't get this on camera. 
With the taxman, some secrets can never be shared. Work done, and it's time for serious business. This is nice, this. Sweet and salt chicken, a little bit of that. What a diet, you see. <laughs> it's a seafood diet, you see, I eat. The taxman gets by on six meals a day, totaling 12,000 calories, enough for four men. This is one of his favorite places, an eat-as-much-as-you-can buffet, which Brian takes as a personal challenge. But he maintains he's not greedy. To be a prize fighter requires natural ability, training, and heavy calorie consumption. When I'm doing the taxing, you've got to be able to fight, because sometimes you might go to a house, you might kick the door, and there might be ten lads in there, you might have to fight the sort of, um, I've beaten the doors before, and there might be one lad, you might tax them, but you might go and there might be loads of people in there backing them up, and you've got to stand there. Sometimes you might have a fight for 12 minutes, and sometimes you might have a fight for 10 minutes, but uh, you've got to be prepared, so that's why you've got to do all different types of exercise and different types of, uh, different types of sports, you see. But while Cockrell has yet to encounter a man who can match his muscle, will he meet his equal in the animal kingdom? Look, they just look like monsters. Oh, massive. If you had your arm round, you could hold it. But once it put the pushing down the other way, the pressure is unbelievable. A one-man justice system who targets drug dealers for a large slice of their profits. To reach the top of his profession, the taxman had to prove to the underworld that he was an unstoppable force, prepared to do anything for their cash. In his game, reputation is everything. I pulled up to an eating stone and I threw him on a marble table. I nearly broke his back and snapped the, it. It's about two inch table, snapped it in half. I split his nose wide open, he hit the deck. I dropped him, he jumped up again, nutted him again, and dropped him again. I said, I haven't even fucking punched you yet, and I've dropped you twice. I said, Are you daft when I went home, slapped him, and I knocked him out of the palm behind, and he, and he took his fucking head off, perforated his eardrum. But inevitably, this one man, steroid filled powerhouse, was to meet his match. Lee Duffy, a young boxer and street fighter with an awesome reputation as an underworld enforcer. But when they finally met, Brian claims that Duffy was no match for the taxman's left hook. So he ran at me and grabbed my legs and tried to pick me up and put me down, but my strength was probably, I was arguably one of the strongest people in the world at the time and broken world records at the time. So I grabbed all the Lee. And I picked him up and I ran at him and threw him into this door and the door fucking smashed his head into there. And he fell back and I head butted him, I threw him at the end of the door really hard. I head butted him twice, he fell to the floor. I hit him with the elbow in the face. As he went down, I kneed him in the face. But in true butch and sundown style, after beating each other to a pulp, they became firm friends. He said there. Um, oh, fucking look at the size of this. Imagine me trying to fight someone like you. I must be fucking mental, he said. Because he wasn't a small lad. He was like six foot four, 17, 17 and a half stone. And uh, he said, he said, uh, the strongest, biggest lad I've ever, strongest lad I've ever met, man. He said he had hideous strength. And uh, anyway, we became, got together and we became the most fierce um, partnership ever in Teesside and the most ruthless. Um, all the drug dealers shut down everywhere in Teesside because we went around taxing them all, kicking the doors in. The Duffy and Cockrell partnership inevitably made enemies. Before long, a price was put on their heads and a hitman was hired. I mean, Lee were walking down the town. This lad had put a contract on to have us killed. Anyway, the lad um, had put, uh, was going to have me shot. And uh, anyway, we kidnapped him, took him to this point here, took him down the gear there. I put tie wraps on his hands, put a rope on his leg, and I kicked him in the sea there. I had him in the sea, bobbing up and down. Obviously, fucking drowned him. I had him in about 20, 30 seconds, pulled him back in. But we never had no more fucking trouble for him. Took the money off the money. He had a big stash of money, drug dealer. And uh, a few, well, about three months later, he was shot dead. Were you responsible for his death? No, no. It was alleged I was, but uh, no, um, I did, I done my bit of fishing that day. I got my revenge that day. He was a horrible bastard, but. Uh, you know, if someone's going to take, if someone's going to try and kill me, I have no compulsion whatsoever to take them out. I would throw.
but their partnership was to be savagely ended. Teesside boxer and nightclub bouncer Lee Duffy was stabbed to death last night in the centre of Middlesbrough. A stretch of blood near a pedestrian crossing was a grim reminder of the savage killing. Police believe that Duffy may have been killed as part of an underworld feud. Lee Duffy, I'll dress this for. Brian, you won't make 30 of you, you've got too much bottle kicking doors and running that fucking drug deals with guns and he's just got no respect for life type of thing. He own. he said you won't make 30, but sadly he was the one who didn't make 30. Mm. I'm still here now. And that's the most remarkable thing about Brian Cockrell. The very fact that he's still here today, still in business and still taxing. He puts it down to learning a lesson from every incident in his shadowy past. One night, I come out of here about five o'clock in the morning, I was with a friend, Ranjit, a Pakistani lad. And there's a kid here waiting for him with a shotgun, and he jumped out of from one of these cars. I'm going to fucking shoot you, packy bastard, he shouted, and he had the shotgun, ready to shoot him. And I'm joking, I said, hey, put the fucking gun down. So he stood and it was close as you and I now. I said, put the fucking gun down, put the fucking gun down, I said, and he went, I'll fucking shoot you, Brian, I said, come on then, shoot me. I said, at the end of the day, you shoot me, I'm dead, I don't worry about it. But see, all these fucking witnesses are on here, and you go to jail for the rest of your life, you're a fucking dickhead, and I'll put, so he, he, he run with a gun and fucked off. What I'm trying to say is, you can't outrun a gun, you can't run a bullet. This is an old saying that you charge a gun and run from a knife. In 1992, the taxman's luck was to run out. His violent methods had upset too many people. Local villains lured him to a house. It was a trap. Today, the house is no longer owned by gangland figures, but the memories remain strong. The lads ran out and hit me on the head with a hammer. Another one put a gun to my head. He split my head over me, yeah? and then pulls all over my head. Obviously, you can't see them because of the air. Uh, I had something like 160 stitches or something ridiculous in my whole body. And they tried to get me on the floor and they couldn't get me down. I was fighting with them. In the end, I fell to the floor. We fell in some slipping water and that. And uh, the next minute, the, uh, the run in and the heavyweight boxer had uh, a pot bread bin and he was smashing me in the face with a bread bin shot and break his jaw. Obviously, I broke his jaw, but he couldn't break my jaw. And it wasn't like one of them films, the old black and white films you see, you get hit on the head with a gun and you're not, you get knocked out in a second. And I wasn't in that film anyway. Um, it's a totally different thing. And uh, in the end, they ran out of the house and the man next door took me to hospital. And when I looked out, I seen Brian just hanging over the wall. And I thought, ah, oh, bloody hell. Oh, the blood was all over the place. Underworld figures are believed to be behind the savage beating of powerlifter Brian Cockrell. Cockrell was left for dead by a gang who beat him with hammers and baseball bats. Doctors in South Cleveland Hospital are due to operate on Mr. Cockrell's injuries. Can you see, can you see some of your wounds? Yeah, I was slashed with a machete on my leg here. I've been hit with hammers in the legs, and you can see the hammer holes in my legs, and this one here as well, and you see the hammer holes there, and I've been hit with bars, I'm stabbed in the back of the legs, I've got bloody, I'm sure you're leaving, uh, skin grafts on my thighs, where I've been, you can see where the skin's been taken off of there, stabbed in the backs of the legs. It's nice to see the guy now, but I didn't think I'd see him again, I thought he lost too much blood. I thought we were going to die, yeah. And, uh, honestly, I just thought he'd, he'd have gone it would have been somebody who's just, just normal. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have lived. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give it. All it did is enhance my reputation because people said, "How can you beat him? If twelve lads can't beat him in a house, with knives, guns, and baseball bats, and put him, put him out of the game." They said, "I've been pushing up daisies now. You'll never see him again. He'll be in Blackpool, a boarding house, or something like that. He'll be going to Spain." I didn't. I was straight back out. And the lad said, "He's fucking crazy, this fucker." The only one way to stop him to kill him. And then my mate said, "Yeah, you kill him, and he'll still fucking probably still come back at you." But in time, the taxman was well enough to go back to his old ways. There was an allegation of, I'd done a massive armed robbery. Um, it was all silence out here. I looked out, there was police, I'm police, I'm police on the floor. So I had to lie down on the floor and just assume the position, as I say. Hands behind my back, handcuffed, um, was taken up. I was arrested, taken to the police station. I said that I'd uh, 
grabbed a black lad, Nigerian kid, put a handgun to his head and robbed him of £50,000 worth of heroin. The lad was supposed to pick me out in an ID parade. He come around, he says, no, that's not him. And uh, they said, well, I thought you said he was like 23 stone, 6 foot 3. And his name was Brian, and he said, no, that's not him. So, anyway, they never got me for it, but, uh, but I'm the only person ever to be arrested for taking drugs off a drug dealer. And he was given immunity. But it's no wonder the kind of witnesses pretend that they haven't been there or yeah. disappear or kind of don't give evidence or whatever. Would you, would you be a witness? Give against you. <laughs> I'll tell you one, one thing, I'd, give, I'd think twice about it. In fact, yeah, I can understand most, most people would not. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. And yeah. so have you ever had a witness give evidence against you? Ever? Never they went been. to the police station but it's never been caught. So, so the witness's testimony changes miraculously? Yes. Or they, or they go off on holidays and... Or they go away for a week, so okay. it seems... Miraculous things happen, don't they? But uh, but you can't. I mean, th th the police must be incensed because you know if they try and prosecute you fa fairly, then, yeah, yeah. Then, then then they never get a success. I mean, with the crimes that you've done, yeah. you've only had a dr uh, one driving conviction. Yeah. How was that? Because I've never had no, I've never been found guilty in anything. Like I say, there's been no the evidence the police have had have never been enough to convict me. For the last six years, the taxman has worked without a break. He is prevented from travelling abroad because his dogs are so vicious that no one outside the family would look after them. But with teenage son Jordan staying at home, Brian and Amanda take a rare chance to visit the Canary Islands. Year-round sunshine with all the comforts of home. That's the cherry off me. That was the taxman. Fantastic. Everybody at the Canary Isle, sunshine every day. Amanda's happy, we'll get the tan. It's peace and quiet. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> He's fast, isn't he? <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like me at feeding time. <laughs> well, uh, Right. Strong, eh? Strong, eh? Yes. <laughs> strong, strong man, Britain, strong man, yes. You no, know, when I went to Greece, it was the same, because they love Hercules, Achilles, and all these type of things, so they can relate to strength, and they stare at you, and they give you, admire you, because they admire the hard work you've done. I'm saying, I'm saying you could buy, like, a tobacco shop here, yeah. tobacco in it. They're here to relax, but they've also got an eye on business. Something like that. You could make good money off them, couldn't you? How much is that? 20, that's 12 pounds, isn't it? For, and how much is it in England? It's almost a 4 pounds 75. That's 47 pounds, isn't it? So it's like half the price, less than half price. Not bad. And that's for me, yeah. So if you bought it from the warehouse, you'd get me even cheap, wouldn't you? How much is this back home? 20 quid, 18 quid. That's what I hear. 6 pounds 25. Don't you? You've got me. How much is that? It's about 20 at home. Right. We're going to come here, um, we retire in the next few years um, because it's a nice nice culture. Um, Spanish people are, are more laid back than, than back home. People are nice here. Um, and plus, there's more opportunities out here. Once maybe start a water sport, you know, um, jet skis on the beach or deck chairs, something like that, or maybe getting into buying clothes and selling clothes in a market store. The island holds magical appeal for the taxman. Locals are astonished by his size. There are clear business opportunities, and then there are the animals. Whoa! Hello, fat man. Jesus, he's a beauty. You see, they've got a bite over 800 pounds. That strength is unbelievable. I'm still heavier than that croc. I'll become arguably the strongest person in the world at one time. But the strength, obviously, with the fighting ability, is very dangerous because you're probably six times stronger than the average person on the street. You know what the hippos are? We're down at number 30 and we are now at number 8. Number 30? The, uh, the anacondas, 30 foot long, 28 inches thick, or 28 foot long, 30 inches thick, whatever. And uh, they've killed people as well. You know?
it's not the stress on that, it's worrying that you could kill someone so easy in a fight. It's not what people can do to me, it's obvious what I can do to them, it frightens me more than what they can do to me. There he is, there's a baby. Bite you completely in half. Absolutely enormous. £4,400. That's just phenomenal. They're six times stronger than a human, them. A chimp. But the gorillas are about eight. Look at the size of him. He's the, he's the boss. Isn't he? I'll be keeping that record what I've been eating on holiday. <coughs> I'll just give you the first day instead of going right through the full week. Um, for breakfast, I'll have had four coffees, one banana, one apple, one pear, an orange, sugar puffs of milk, three yogurts, four toast, three scrambled eggs, one sausage, beans, tropical juice, four bacon. That'll be breakfast. Lunch time, two chops with veg, pasta, potatoes, rice. And a fruit cocktail, three ice creams, jelly, chocolate, cake, and a locus aid, two yogurts, ham salad sandwich, two of them, and four cups of coffee. And dinner time, one chicken curry fried rice, a second beef curry noodles and rice, three bowls of ice cream, one cake, sponge cake, a coffee with milk, two Sprite and half a pint of water. Late supper, two bottles of water, two ice cream, one banana, three coffees, further bottle of water, three hot dogs, two buns, two hamburgers, three buns, another four yogurts, glass of Fanta, glass of orange, two cokes, another bottle of water, till three at three a.m. in the morning, ham, cheese, salad, sandwich. Half a pint of milk. That's it. That's that's one day's from roughly. Back home and drink ten pints of milk as well a day. Obviously milk is horrible. Eve is a gangster and self-declared taxman are numbered. As he gets older, he will no longer be able to extort fortunes from criminals. But can he put his violent lifestyle behind him? Hello. That's, that's the parrot, not me. <laughs> Hello, son. What do they call him? Chee -chee. I used to have a parrot. I called him Herman because he was like a little monster. No, Herman Monster. <laughs> and I give him away to a friend. I give him to a friend because he was... And two days later, he started speaking. I thought, if, if he tells the police everything, I know. I'll get about fucking 30, yeah? <laughs> I've seen him in here with guns and all sorts. <laughs> I know where the bodies are buried. Under <laughs> On the patio. <laughs> Telling where the bodies are buried has been a real problem for the taxman. Like many enigmatic underworld figures, he has written a warts and all book detailing his life story. But that in itself is a legal minefield, as the most shocking stories can never be told. A true life confession would send the taxman straight to jail. You couldn't tell them where the bodies are buried, could you? And you couldn't really tell them uh, how many people you've shot. You can say, I mean, say you have had someone shot. You can't tell them things what you've done. But like you haven't been arrested for. You can only tell them the things what you've, you've been arrested for and alleged. But uh, you can't come out and say, well, I've robbed this place and I've robbed that place and I've done this and I've done that because you're obviously, you're obviously incriminating yourself. But the things what I've done in the book were all alleged offences. But this is probably just the ice tip of the uh, of, of what I've done in my life. So. Brian Cockrell, the taxman, is an enigma. Persuasive yet terrifying. Blunt and sharp, brutal to some and compassionate to others. He's one of a kind, but is yet to come to terms with the fact that his taxing days may be coming to an end. When you're getting older, you realise the most precious thing in life is your life, your freedom and your fitness. But uh, when you're younger, you don't care, you're just mad. You know, but now, if someone said, oh, there's a, a dealer's got something to turn on there, I'd check him up first now. Let's have a look at see, you know, plan it all. But yeah, so I just could go and kick the door and run in. Because as you get older, right, you can maintain your fitness and respect yeah. and all that, and you keep your strength. Uh, what happens when you're 75? Well, I am old now. I'm 42 this year, so I'm still here. But uh, we've come to that one, come to yeah. that bridge and cross that bridge and come to it. But yeah. I think the taxing thing's finished because there's that many dealers now. <laughs>
There's a lot of people who've kind of hit, hit a lot of money, uh, like been through a lot of money, millions of pounds, like you've been, yeah. you know, and they come from kind of council backgrounds. Some, a lot of them, yeah. don't know where squandered the money. Squandered the money. Yeah, squandered. Now, have you squandered it all? Yeah, I've squandered my money. Um, I've, I've lived life to the full. I've lived life a million miles an hour. But you're running the risk of some young gun coming up with a uh, revolver and taking you out. And yeah, no, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter how big your biceps oh, yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. You know, the bullet, if it gets you to the right spot, you're dead. Yeah. But Does that bother you? No. The future is uncertain for the taxman. He faces an uphill battle if he's ever to become mayor of Middlesbrough. He may take a bullet for a tax too far. Or perhaps he will live up to his promise to rent out deck chairs on a stretch of Spanish beach. The biggest fear is that he will take his muscle to another part of Britain and start afresh. Only the taxman knows, and he's not saying. We're back with Donald McIntyre next Tuesday at 11 when he visits Glasgow and hears first-hand accounts from various gang members who are self-confessed hitmen. For exclusive video footage not shown on TV, visit the website at 5.tv slash McIntyre's Underworld.